Well, we are, yes, in the midst of a sermon series, Seek First the Kingdom of God, where we're focusing again and again on Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus says to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Here's one of the truest things I can say about that. I read this this week from somebody else, and I just thought it was a great way of saying a little bit of what this is about, that what you believe about the future will change how you live in the present. What you believe about the future will change how you live in the present. That Christians are people who believe that the kingdom of God is already, but not yet. That it was already inaugurated by Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and ascension. But that it is not yet fully consummated. So inaugurated, but not yet fully consummated. And so there's something that's happening, that the future is coming into the present as that kingdom of God comes to be more and more fulfilled. And what you believe about the future will change how you live in the present. And so as we seek first the kingdom of God, what does that look like? And so as we look at the Sermon on the Mount in which Jesus says that, It's clear that he's saying that the kingdom of God stands in contrast to many other visions of possible or possible visions for our lives. In other words, if we were going to ask, hey, what does it mean to seek first the kingdom of God? One answer to that question is that we would explore varying sort of contrasting visions of what it means to live life. And so that's what Jesus lays out and he helps us understand what seeking the kingdom is about by not only laying what it is, but also saying what it is not. So he says things like, hey, it's not just loving your neighbors, it's loving your neighbors and your enemies. Hey, it's not just pointing out the speck in somebody else's eye, it's being more concerned about the log in your own eye. Or it's not about building on shaky foundations, but about building on the surest foundation of them all. And it's not about storing up treasures on earth so much as treasures in heaven, which is this contrast presented in Matthew 6, 19 through 21, where Jesus talks about what we're invested in. And as I mentioned last week when we talked about this passage, it has this twofold meaning, this sort of double meaning. Um, It's about both material goods and earthly accolades. So material goods in the sense that Life is about more than the abundance of our possessions, which are temporary, non-durable kinds of things. Um, That's what last week was about. It's better to make eternal investments with our stuff. Um, But it's also about more than just material goods. This is about earthly accolades, and that's what I want to focus on this week in part two of storing up treasures. So yes, we're going to be in Matthew 6 again in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, and eventually we'll get to Matthew 23, that other text. But first, let's pray. Holy Spirit, we pray that you come in power. We know that left to our own devices, we will not be fully present here in this space. We will not be fully present to what your word has to say to us. So we pray, Holy Spirit, that you get a hold of our hearts and minds and souls and everything about us, young and old, so that we can truly pay attention to what your word has to say to us here this morning. May it be so. And all your people say, amen, amen. So this is Matthew chapter 6. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eyes are the lamp of the body. So if your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either a slave will hate the one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Therefore, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of much more value than they? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? 
And why do you worry about clothing? Look at the flowers of the field. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was clothed like one of these. If God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, asking, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? For it is the pagans who strive after all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. So it's my sense that when we hear uh, this the first part of that passage, especially that first part, right, about treasures, that we tend to interpret it literally and immediately think of literal treasures, so material goods, wealth, money, and rightly so, because that's part of what it's about. But the passage seems to be about much more than that. It seems to be about figurative or metaphorical treasure as well, that we make investments in heaven, not with Not just with our money and our possessions, but also with every aspect of our lives, including our very way of being. Because listen to the beginning, uh, uh, the passage that comes right before this. Okay, so this is the beginning of Matthew 6. Beware of practicing your righteousness before others in order to be seen by them. For if you do, you have no reward from your Father in heaven, which sounds a lot like a differentiation between something happening on earth and something happening in heaven. And then he goes on and he talks about three different disciplines that we engage in. So he says, so whenever you give to the needy, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they will be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be done in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you, which sounds a heck of a lot like storing up treasures on earth versus storing up treasures in heaven. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward, i.e. storing up treasures on earth which are not going to last. That attention from others is going to go away. And then he proceeds, not only giving to the needy, but also praying. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward, their earthly treasure. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you, storing up treasures in heaven. And then finally, he talks about fasting. And when you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces to show others that they're fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head if you have hair. Wash your face so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So it's not surprising that Jesus would then, right after this, say, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. He's not just talking about literal stuff. He is, but he's not just talking about material goods that can be ruined by literal moths and literal rust. He's also talking about immaterial goods that don't last, including earthly accolades which bring temporary positive attention but don't last. So what he's doing is he's comparing the form of righteousness, that form of righteousness that aims to impress people with goodness, with kingdom righteousness. So we might rearrange the verses like this in order to make some sense of exactly what he's saying. Beware of practicing your righteousness before others in order to be seen by them, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven for where your treasure is, there your heart will be 
also. And this whole idea of the way in which we behave here on earth and in order to maybe attract earthly attention, he's deadly serious about this, not only in the Sermon on the Mount, but in lots of other places as well. So that's where that Matthew 23 passage comes in. Jesus said to the crowds and to the disciples, this is shortly before he's about to go and die on our behalf. This is one of the last things that he's saying. He's wanting to bring some attention to this, to the potential religious, to the religious leaders of his day. So the crowds and disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, so you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide. Their phylacteries, these are these things that they would carry, they'd have around their arms. And they could have either just this, this thin stripe of it, or, hey, you could make it really wide so it's really big and easy to notice. It's kind of like, I don't know, carrying a big Bible or something. And the tassels on their garments, long. So the tassels were things that God had commanded them to have to remind them of the laws of the Lord, right? And so they made them long, so they're noticeable. And do not call, oh, no, sorry. They make their tassels on their garments long, verse 6. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplace and to be called rabbi by others. So they love this attention. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. So um, this is part of where it comes from to say, hey, uh, to have some humility. Uh, I often do not ask for people to call me pastor because of this passage. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. And, you know, in Catholic churches and other traditions, they call them father. Um, And I've never seen a great explanation of why, considering this passage. I don't want to bash Catholics, but maybe you shouldn't call priests father. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So this is this, this is this theme that's not only present in the Sermon on the Mount, but present here as he's talking to people before he's going to go off and die. It's present over and over and over again. The last shall be first. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. And it's this massive warning to all of us, but especially to leaders of ministries and the whole idea of Uh, what we can get caught up in these days. We live in a celebrity-driven culture, and we can have churches driven by celebrities too, and we ought to be wary of that. When church leaders are given special attention and perks and privileges, that's not good. If that ever happens around here, you should call it out. And you should be wary of any ministry that's named after a person. Sometimes People justify that and say, well, it's, you know, that person's teaching so good, we need to make sure that people know if they need to find that teaching, they search for that name, whatever that name happens to be. And I just think in light of passages like this and so many others, it doesn't matter how many people you want to be attracted to that, you still have to name it something else that's not named after the person. Um, but even though it's about some of those leaders, it's about having a different righteousness than some of the leaders that Jesus was saying, don't follow them. It is about more than that. So don't be fooled. This isn't just about needy, narcissistic, attention-seeking megalomaniacs. This is about every human on planet Earth because every single one of us have basic needs for belonging, acceptance, affirmation, and so much more. We have these basic needs. They're legitimate needs that need to be met. They're not just wants, they're needs. And all of us are prone to having those needs met in illegitimate ways. So there are legitimate needs that sometimes we get met in illegitimate ways. Um, So here's a few of the ways in which we seek 
to have legitimate needs met in illegitimate ways by storing up treasures on earth. All these sorts of things, including that first one, being good, which is part of what it's about in Matthew chapter 6 when he's calling out all this behavior. And sometimes we're good for all the right reasons, but we can also be good and become obsessed with being good because we have a tremendous fear of, seeing, of being seen as bad or evil or corrupt or less than in any sort of way. Because if people see that, then they might reject me or abandon me, which goes back to these basic needs. I, I, I want to be accepted and affirmed and feel a place of belonging. And so sometimes I can be good for the wrong reasons. But if I'm good, because uh, if I'm good and I do things right, people will be impressed. I'll be accepted by them. And all that anxiety and fear of rejection will go away. But that's not a proper motivation for finding those places of belonging and affirmation and acceptance. Those are ways that we store up treasures on earth instead of seeking first the kingdom. Um, or even that second one, caring for others or loving others. You might, you might uh, think, man, why, why, why would it be bad? What could be wrong with loving and caring for others? Obviously, that's a really good thing. But sometimes we use love to get love i.e. we're motivated by fear of being unworthy and unloved, and so we subconsciously think, if I just love each uh, others enough, then maybe they'll look past my faults and love me and want me and accept me. And one of the ways to know if this is your motivation in loving others is if you get bitter if they don't love you in return. But we don't give love in order to get love. We give love because God first loved us. It comes from a different place. The point is, like, we have all these legitimate needs for love and affirmation and belonging, and it's so tempting to pursue a path that will get those needs met in very temporary ways, even by doing things that otherwise seem good. And to seek first the kingdom and his righteousness is to seek to have those needs met by God, by being secure in his love for us, by being secure in Christ to the extent that I know that I'm a child of God, that's whose I am and who I am, right? And if that's who I am and I can live in that security, I don't have to pursue all those other um, ways of having my needs met for belonging and affirmation and acceptance and invest in all these earthly things. Which are all things that, man, I'm just reminded of because, hey, we're coming off of um, uh, homecoming. Homecoming was yesterday. For those of you who don't have kids, at TC Central at least it was, and I know at TC Christian it was. Um, and that just automatically takes me back to that time period in my life when I was a teenager and was... Um, so insecure and sought attention in all the wrong ways and sought love um, in all the wrong places. And it was partially because I had these legitimate needs for belonging and acceptance and affirmation and so much more that you could add to the list and those needs just weren't being met. And so, gosh, out of appetite for it, I was going and searching for it, and oftentimes trying to impress people, whether by winning over their favor or just impressing them with how much of a rebel and how cool I was, which I never was. And the interesting thing is that when I became a Christian uh, in college, I think the temptation w was to do the same. And what I mean by that, do the same, was to, to look good or at least not look bad. But now from just like a different standpoint, it shifted from just being like a, a needy teenager to being done from a religious standpoint. Like I'm going to do all these good things and I'm going to read my Bible better than you read your Bible. 
and more often than you read your Bible, and longer than you read your Bible. Um, in other words, it was just so easy for me to turn into a Pharisee or a hypocrite, like he's talking about, in order to be seen by others and thought well of by others. Um, and frankly, lots of aspects of church life reinforced that, made me feel like I needed to have my act together. And, and uh, not only on Sunday do we come dressed in our Sunday best, but we show up in other places that same way, like we've got to have our act together. And it's amazing to me that despite coming to Christ, I had such a fundamental misunderstanding of the gospel of the kingdom. That I felt like I still had to store up treasures on earth by making sure everybody thought I had my act together. And that I would at least look good or uh, that I would look good or at least not look bad. And it was such a revelation to me when I truly understood the gospel of the kingdom. That there's no level of earning, but everything is received by grace. And that God isn't waiting for me to show up as I should be, but accepts me as, my, as I am with the expectation of who I am becoming. Wants to see me live into who he's made me to be, but never, ever waits for me to show up completely having all my act together. And so part of what it means to seek first the kingdom of God is to stop trying to win the approval of not only God, but others who are all around me. And instead, show up exactly as I am, because God can do so much more with the fullness of my authentic sense of self, and so much more with my um, honest, transparent, hey, these are the places where I don't have it together, the places where I need to repent and have you align me more with your kingdom, Lord which is not at all about building up some sort of earthly kingdom or earthly attention, but is instead about seeking first his kingdom, which means his rule, his reign, which my life is never, all the way till the day I die, going to be perfectly aligned with his rule or reign. And so it behooves me and it behooves you and behooves all of us to be much more honest about that in such a way that we're not trying to put off some sort of righteousness like Pharisees, these people that he repeatedly calls hypocrites who are trying to gather attention for what they do, but instead are investing in the kingdom and investing in the kingdom and investing in the kingdom and understand the goodness of the kingdom, which is not about any sort of earthly impressions and earthly impressiveness. And so just like these other sermons that we've had in this sermon series, I want to invite you into the kingdom and I want to give the invitation today to give up the need for any sort of earthly attention or accolades in favor of seeking first the kingdom and his righteousness, which is received, not earned, which is the place where all of those legitimate needs for belonging and affirmation and acceptance and so much more, where all those legitimate needs are met, is by the king of kings. The one whose reign has been inaugurated but not yet fully consummated. And so part of what it means to seek first that kingdom is to seek to have those needs met over and over and over again by him and then live freely in the world in such a way that we're not trying to pursue to have those needs met by other people, which is such an unfair expectation for everybody else. We can provide some spaces of belonging and affirmation of acceptance. We can provide some of those spaces, but never as perfectly as God has done so in Christ. And so part of what it means to be invited into that kingdom is to be really uneasy about earthly accolades and attention and to be really eased into the arms of God who is going to provide those legitimate needs for us over and over and over again so that we can follow Jesus in every aspect of our lives, not only with our material investments, but it's our whole way of being. We're invested in a kingdom that is not of this world, but is coming into this world. Let's pray. Lord, I lift up to you anyone here present 
who needs to put all their trust in you that their needs will be met by you. We go searching in all the wrong places, looking for love in all the wrong places, looking for affection and affirmation and belonging in some ways that are attention-seeking and narcissistic and hypocritical. So straighten us out and help us to find that true source of strength, which is your love and your grace. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would penetrate through any hardness in our own hearts, any incapacity to understand it or feel it, that we could truly be overwhelmed even today by your grace. We want to seek first your kingdom so that we store up treasures in that kingdom and not in this earthly world. We pray your help, your help, your help. And all your people say, Amen.